Okay, let's get started again here. Um, someone asked during the break about how this 100 terabytes gets generated. There's this tool called GenSort. Um, if you search, if you kind of Google GenSort, you'll, you should come upon it. So yeah, this generates 100 terabytes, pass in some parameters. You can uh, specify the number of records, you can specify binary or ASCII. Uh, this is what you feed in. You can actually generate partitions. So you have partition data. And then uh, the opposite is val sort. So this is the tool that you use to validate that you've sorted the data. So, yeah, these are the official tools for these challenges. So, yeah, kind of fun to play around with. And then I've got, within the pipeline, if you look at GitHub here, uh, within pipeline code itself, um, there's this subdirectory called my apps, uh, my, yeah, my application. So, anything I, I've been talking about, those perf statements are all within mechanical sympathy. And these are the scripts. So here's that perf statement. It's a little bit longer than the one I showed up on the screen. But. And then you pass in the events, and then you can, I think there's a way even, let's see, I think if you do perf, <coughs> yeah, perf list uh, gives you all of the things that you can track. So within uh, Docker, there's one trick within Docker is that you have to run your uh, Docker container with the dash dash privileged. That gives you lower level access to get to these hardware counters, right? So these are the things that we looked at. Uh, there's like hundreds of these, but yeah, these are the ones, some of the ones that we looked at. Um, so let's see, yeah, context switches, CPU migrations, of stuff in here. You can look at network, um, what's going on with the network, what's going on with ext4. Uh, VM scan, so right, like virtual memory, the paging, if you're trying to tweak uh, what's going on there. Uh, file mapping, yeah, you're like memory mapping. Yeah, lots and lots of stuff here. Yeah, so you can actually use um, and basically put in counters for how many times uh, specific system calls are being called. So this is important if you don't expect something to be called because you've used some, some way at the application layer to avoid. And then you, you trace it and then get a count and see if it's greater than zero, then you know you didn't do uh, really something right. So. Yes, if you keep an eye on that guy, Brendan Gregg's blog, yeah, he, he talks about all of these in a lot of depth. Okay. Okay, 
So let's keep going with the presentation. Yes, any questions? Got yeah, a couple people came up during the break, but. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about how they ended up saturating the network and disk. Um, you've got these 100-byte records. You have 100 terabytes of these, 10-byte keys. Some of the things that they did, they, they created, or they customized these data structures. They replaced the old Java util hash map. Uh, they have specific algorithms now that um, are optimized for uh, the, these like big data processing workloads, right? So with any big data, system, right, like MapReduce, uh, Spark, yes, anything really, you're constantly shuffling things. It's, it, yeah, it's less big data than it is more like distributed systems, right? So, um, you, but in really big data, really right, typically you do need to split it up amongst multiple machines because you physically don't have enough disk space or rather like, enough memory to store it all on a single machine. So once you go distributed like that, now there's, there has to be some way to pull things that are together back to uh, one place where they're together. So that's the shuffle. Um, so shuffle is, is a bad uh, thing. You should try to avoid it if you can. Um, but of course, any time that you do joins or any time you do like a distinct, right? Like distinct is a surprisingly scary uh, rather operator because in order to figure out distinct, you now have to gather uh, really everything down to, in, you know, that is similar into one one key space so you can figure out what's distinct. So keep an eye on that one. Okay, so this was the, yeah, so again, the goal is here, saturate network, saturate disk. To win the challenge, you have to get the, the highest throughput. So that's the rate. So how many terabytes per minute can you uh, sort through? Uh, this was the old record in 2013 by Yahoo, um, 2,100 machines. So, you know, these are physical uh, nodes within their data centers. Took 72 minutes. Um, let's see, dedicated uh, 10 uh, gigabit and 1.42 terabytes. Spark comes along a year later. Uh, they made the changes for 1.2. We'll talk about some of those in a sec, how they, what they actually changed. Um, they had 28,000 partitions, so that's 28,000, uh, not necessarily nodes, right? In fact, they only had 206 nodes to work with. These are EC2 nodes, um, but in order to process all 28,000, it has to go through five times, right? It has to do five iterations um, to process all those partitions. So, um, yeah, the number of cores, too, you can see 50,000 cores versus 6,600 cores and it got three times the, the throughput. Yeah, also too, just to mention, they disabled caching, right, the in-memory caching. So Spark is uh, really commonly associated with its ability to use up rather cluster memory and yeah, use it efficiently. Uh, so for this challenge, they turned that off because the goal here was to saturate the network and the disk um, and not to prove that this is a good in-memory uh, data uh, like management tool. So it's more apples to apples uh, comparison with Hadoop with that memory disabled, with that memory caching disabled. So something to note. Uh, so this is focused more on the actual uh, processing engine itself, the Spark, the Spark execution engine. Because they had these uh, machines for the whole month, uh, to do these tests, they decided to actually scale it out to one petabyte. So this isn't part of the challenge, but they wanted to see what what more do we, uh, you know, or to show some of the linear scalability, right? So they, they, uh, yes, like they generated uh, 1,000, uh, like, yes, terabytes, so one petabyte. Um, they had about the same number of machines. Yeah, there were 190, um, and it actually maintained the same sort rate, yeah, the same throughput. And they had 250,000 partitions in that one. Here's some, uh, yeah, some more details about the hardware. 206 workers, they were, uh, the Amazon I2-8XLs. These are the specs on the Amazon, that particular instance type. 32, 244 gig, uh, eight um, of the SSDs, RAID 0 striped, right? 
Um, they were, they're trying to achieve three gigabytes per second for the disk I.O. Um, that's the maximum that the controller can handle. And then 10 gigabit for the network. Now, they were using Amazon placement groups, which is like an optimized way to, to group your uh, like EC2 instances. Um, it's got a little bit better, uh, more stable networking because you're not competing with other uh, like customers of Amazon. It's, yeah, just you. Uh, they turned on some switches here uh, that like Amazon provides for some more networking. Yeah, so iPerf is showing 9.5 consistently, yeah, with very low jitter. So that was uh, as close as they can get to the uh, 10 uh, like gigabit. Yeah, why only 206? Um, we'll show in a slide or two that, uh, yeah, after 206, they are saturating the network. So there's, yeah, there's no reason to keep adding more nodes. Um, yeah, so I'll show the aggregate cluster uh, throughput, and then it you know kind of peaks up. They realize that, that they can't really go any further, and then it drops down to uh, 206, and then stays. Yeah, so they ran a lot of tests, right? They didn't just run one test and post the results. They they ran these to figure out what what's the sweet spot. Yeah, RAID zero. This is encouraged. Um, I thought maybe the challenge would not allow this because they have some strict rules, but. Yeah, they actually do allow them striping. Uh, more on this. So 206 nodes times 32 cores, 6,600 cores. This is getting into a little bit more advanced spark tuning type things. But one thing to take away from this is uh, if you're given a, right, this cluster of, of 6,600 cores, don't just stop at 6,600 cores when you're, when you're spreading your data out. Uh, typically multiply by about four to six, right? Like you want to over provision for uh, right, like that number of cores. Um, so previously Spark, I think before Spark 1, 2, before these, these uh, right, like this challenge happened and these improvements happened, the suggestion was between two and four, but now that they've saturated the network and now CPU is the bottleneck, now you can go four to six. So this is important because this is how you, uh, when you're choosing, when you're first pulling in this huge data set, you have to figure out right, like, the, uh, the right, like, maximum number of partitions um, because that, uh, right, like, that defines where the data is going to be spread, right? So they found through just, like, just yeah, basic testing, the empirical testing, that about 4.25 was the sweet spot for this particular setup. Um, they're using uh, the HDFS short circuit local reads, so that's bypassing like a lot of fluff and going directly down to the data on right, like, the local machine. Um, 2x replication that's required by the gray sort challenge. Um, they use range partitioning, so this is kind of interesting, right? Like typical um, big data workloads, you want to evenly distribute data right, like around the cluster. Uh, you, you would pick some sort of key, right, like your customer ID, um, or like product ID, something like that, that is going to give you even distribution. Um, and that's so that you don't have a single hotspot. Right? Um, here they're using range partitioning. And this is significant because the whole point here is to sort. Right? So typically, like, you're not sorting you know, like a lot. But the, for this particular uh, right, like workload, it's a sort challenge, so they chose range partitioning, which is purposely going to keep things that are similar on the same node. That way you can sort within that node and then share the results with uh, like the rest of the cluster. So to figure out the, like those ranges for the 28,000 partitions, they took the first 10 seconds of the challenge. Um, so there's two pre-processing steps. There's that process where it goes through all the records, pulls out the key, the first 10 bytes and sticks it next to the, the pointer. And then there's this process where it's sampling 79 keys, just rather like randomly, from each partition. Uh, yeah, 79 is a nice prime number. Pulling it down to the central driver, laying all those keys out, right, sorting them, and then chopping them up right, like by 28,000. Uh, and so those are the ranges. That's how it figures out where you put the data.
Okay, I'll probably skip this, but the big change here to this, the shuffle manager, so right, like again, shuffle is the, the bottleneck here for these big data processing engines. Um, you want to get data from the mappers to the reducers uh, as quickly as possible with the right, like least amount of uh, right, like operating system overhead and um, right, like memory buffer uh, like creation, that kind of thing. So, yeah, one thing they did, they started to actually uh, sort on the mapper. So this data is maintained now in a sorted manner. So when this reducer goes to each machine, it, it's going to already get pre-sorted data pulled down. And then you can do like a very quick merge sort. So before, this wasn't all in a single file. It like wasn't seek once and then grab all the data. Um, it was, you know, this data is kind of all spread out. So when that reducer would call into each machine, now this guy's disk is like flopping all over and uh, that whole thing about sequence and sequential scan, uh, yeah, they weren't doing that. So there's a little bit of overhead here in you know, keeping these things sorted, but yeah, overall, uh, it actually helps out. One other thing too, they switched to Netty. So I'm yeah, not sure if you guys have done any Netty programming, but um, it's pretty hairy stuff because it does its own right, like memory management and it's going to reuse byte buffers. Um, so right, like Netty is a it's a network transport written in Java. Um, it is a it's yeah so it's asynchronous uh, versus synchronous Java NIO right. So again, when Spark was first created, they just took whatever tools were available. Uh, yeah, Java NIO was, um, yeah, there were like, yeah, tons of examples. It was really easy to get up and running. But, yeah, by replacing this with, uh, right, this asynchronous Netty, and then switching to zero copy ePoll. So, yeah, this is important. So, uh, this is where you're, you're pulling data off of, so picture, there's the mappers, and then there's the reducers. And that reducer calls into the mapper, is pulling data off of the network, and then putting it on the disk, right? So the sort of naive way is to take all that data, copy it from system space, because it's in system space, rather talking to the controller, copying it into user space, which is creating a lot of Java objects and a lot of memory, and then putting it back down through system space to the disk controller and then writing it out. So now we have three copies of the data. So this is zero copy. This is as data comes in, uh, it's, it, it's just going to use that. It all stays within kernel space and just goes straight to disk. So, smooths out garbage collection, right? Like it's not creating a lot of byte buffers, things like that. Um, yeah, so in blue here, if you see like spark dot something, that's typically some sort of configuration. This is actually, I think this is even being deprecated because Netty is just the default, like there's no more Java NIO. Um, there's yeah, really no reason to keep it around because it's so much slower. Um, but you can actually tweak this a little bit. I don't know why you would, but this is turning turning off uh, the off heat buffers that Netty uses. This is the first time that you see Netty, or that you see the Spark code base doing things off heap. Um, but this, yeah, this is actually part of Netty. Um, yeah, so this way Netty itself has its own code that's running and is you know, really creating objects. But the actual data coming off the pipe can be done off heap. Um, that's a similar to Project Tungsten, where Spark is starting to do that. Um, yeah, so Tim Sort, they, yeah, I think I mentioned this a couple times where Tim Sort, they modified it to now have key value pairs. The original one just takes an array of values, a single value, and just sorts them. Um, because we're in a key value type of workload, uh, just making small tweaks to that helped out a lot. Uh, and then this is the replacement for the Java Util hash map. It's the append only map. So they're able to use open addressing, quadratic probing, some things that uh, are not optimized for the general case. So they're not being used by Java Util hash map, but they do come in handy here. Good memory locality. But you lose the ability to delete values out of the map. But there's no need to do that. So, yeah, this is that uh, chart I was saying. So, 220 gigabit. Um, that's that was the peak that they got out of there. Divided by 206 nodes is about 
So the theoretical max for a 10 gigabyte uh, rally, uh, is 1.25 gigabit, um, so they got close to that. So, yeah, that's what they're going for, and then, yeah, they ended up getting uh, right up to the three gigabyte per second per node disk I/O. Yeah, I don't have a chart for that one, but let's see. Just pull the highlights out here. Um, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, I'll actually show an example of this in the, the second talk, but uh, there's this concept of a broadcast join where you're in, right, like MapReduce terms, this is called a map side join, um, where you're, like you're actually, so picture like a, a huge table of right, like users, right? So you have 60 million users. Um, each user, let's just take, I'll just take the US for example, uh, you know, there's 50 state, yeah. That's 50 states, I think. Uh, 50, 52. Um, so you, you have a, a, a super tiny uh, state table that's just 50, and then you're trying to join that to a 60 million um, person table. And so there's actually benefits to taking that small table and broadcasting it out. And so let's say there's 206 nodes. Yeah, actually broadcast it out to the 206 nodes once, and then just join locally, right? Versus shuffling that data everywhere. Um, okay, so the actual tungsten itself, here's some jeers if you feel like looking. Uh, we'll talk about byte arrays, we'll talk about minimizing GC, CPU, and cache locality, and this concept of dynamic code generation. So, yeah, why is CPU now the bottleneck? Like, yeah, so why is uh, right, like Project Tungsten focusing on CPU specifically now. Yeah, why is it picking on that? Well, so Graysort improved the network and the shuffle by using Netty and by doing some of the custom data structures. Um, network and disk I.O. bandwidth is actually relatively high. Uh, so, let's see, people are starting to do more partitioning. They're starting to think about their data, not just taking data in the CSVs and logs and just dumping them but they're actually post-processing them. Once they come in, they, they're gonna partition them by, uh, at like Netflix, for example, we partitioned our logs every 15 minutes. So if I knew I was looking for some sort of error that happened right after some launch that we did, some uh, rather code release, I could find the, like, the exact quarter hour where we did the release and then just search that which was huge, because I, I didn't have to wait through an entire day or an entire week's worth of logs. I could just narrow it down to a 15-minute thing. Uh, so yeah, think about partitioning, um, pruning, you know, only pull back what you need, right, like column-wise. Uh, like you don't need to, to pull all the fields back. I mean, it's kind of, it's sort of silly, but uh, people don't do this. They, they pull everything back and then just look at a single field. Um, and then predicate push down, so this is, so if you think of pruning as like limiting the columns that are coming back, and then predicate push downs, fancy way of saying filters, is now going to uh, like limit the number of rows coming back by some, some filter, by some predicate, like age greater than 30 or right, something like that. Um, yeah, also too, we've got things, these new file formats that have been uh, starting to get popular recently, like Parquet, that stores things columnar, right, versus row-wise. Uh, they made some changes. So I showed those two black things. There was the one on the left that was hashed, and then the one on the right that was sort, that's using Tim sort on the mapper side. They actually took that, that's, that second one and modified it for tungsten which essentially means they're using the MISC unsafe and using byte arrays. I like to the covers. Oh. <laughs> go. Is he safe back there? there? Yeah, yeah, that is my problem. <laughs> um, let's see. This is a pretty busy slide meant more for uh, like reference later, but yeah, one of the things I, I try to do is highlight 
the, the key classes for these these different projects, these different um, uh, right, like efforts within Spark. So if you do want to quickly go and find you know find out like what are the, the core classes, I've already gone through all the pull requests and all the Jira's, and these are the big ones, right? So there's six main categories that were part of Tungsten. Um, they they improve the aggregations, uh, rather which are huge, um, joins, um, shuffling, uh, sorting. And uh, yeah, of course they they changed custom data structures, right? They, yeah, they, uh, they created some more data structures, specifically right, like these huge byte arrays, and then the ability to go into the byte array and pull out values. Um, and then there's this sort of big one called code generation. Uh, that one's a pretty heavy one that we'll we have a slide or two on later. But um, if you see anything called unsafe, yeah, like I said, this is unsafe row. This is the equivalent to the old, I think it was the internal row as part of Spark SQL. Um, that was the, the big fat Java version, but now it's unsafe row, which is the nice uh, slim byte buffer version. Um, yeah, code generation, just to give you a quick peek ahead. What, so, yeah, there's approximately, what, like 120 uh, maybe, or like UDFs within HiveQL. And this is things like sum and, and uh, right, like average, standard deviation, um, or even just, you know, two like Unix time or right, like various things for, for timestamps, dates. Uh, so before, those specific UDFs were, couldn't be optimized by Spark. Spark didn't understand them. They were like a black box, what, what code was happening there. Um, because they come from a different project, they uh, came from Hive. So they actually created this JIRA with about like 100 tasks and just asked the Spark community to come help out and rewrite it with this code generation step in mind where um, you're now sort of like revealing what's happening behind the covers, right? So now Spark can actually take it and look at the overall plan and can start to rearrange things Right, like to move fil to push filters down, to, uh, right, like move things around. Before, it, it couldn't do anything. So we commonly, at Databricks, um, we were working with a lot of customers that they're, um, they're like sort of right, like POC, right, like type queries, proof of, of concept stuff during testing was super fast. And then when they actually started to move it over to production, they started to pull in these UDFs that they need for their business but would then basically halt the catalyst optimizations, like query plan optimization. So um, there needed to be some way to hook in to this catalyst uh, right, like optimizer layer that would then reveal what's happening, right? So yeah, that's where this code generation comes in. It's a lot of manual effort. It was you know, somewhat controversial. Uh, people were asking for, you know, is there a better way to do this? Can we, you know, without having to rewrite all these Right, like these UDFs, and then now that anyone has their own custom UDF, they have to rewrite it to work with uh, Spark. So here's a little bit more about the unsafe. Um, it has a whole ton of stuff. The only things being used by uh, like Tungsten, Spark, are the ones in blue, or the two uh, red high, those really like high-level categories, and then those specific ones in blue. Um, but yeah, you see, it's basically malloc and free, right? Like a C malloc, um, and then free in the memory. So yeah, doing your own, uh, right, like memory management and garbage collection, that kind of thing. But there's, yeah, there's lots of other scary things that Misc Unsafe gives you. Like you can do your own synchronization, and there's the compare and swap. Um, that was, yeah, you can get pretty crazy in there if you want to. So I looked at, I sat down one day and I, I searched uh, GitHub for the term unsafe and um, I think tungsten or something and I thought maybe there'd be like 20 or 30 classes so I, I started typing them out. I was watching NFL football Sunday, um, yeah, doing nothing. And yeah, like eventually filled up three of these columns. Uh, so there, there's 200 source code files that were changed, um, which, I mean, this was exactly people's concern, right? This, this is a pretty heavy-duty change. Let's get some more people behind it. Uh, so, 
yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but yes, yeah, so like I said, the, the, right, the complexity of the code base got a lot uh, right, like heavier with all this byte buffer stuff. So just to give you a context as to why this uh, byte buffer stuff is necessary, you've got, uh, if, you, if you just take a, 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 a simple four byte string within Java and then blow it out to, um, so think of on disk, this is just four bytes. And then when you pull it into Java, now it's 48 bytes, right? Because you have a lot of these like object, uh, really headers, and then you've got hash codes, you've got, um, you've got all kinds of stuff going on. And then if now you have a multi-field object that has multiple strings or multiple, so it's got two strings and a, a boxed integer, yeah, that's the other bad thing about Java, is the boxing. So take a primitive of just one, two, three, that's an int. Um, when you, you know, pull it in, it, it gets blown up into this, this boxed integer, this like Java boxed integer. Um, yeah, that has a lot of overhead. So we've all probably done this a little, you know, kind of on the side, or at least thought about it, where we're going to do our own serialization and different ways to represent it. So that, yeah, that's what's happening here. All, uh, so that was, the uh, previous slide was the big blown out Java object. Now this is the nice, so this is the unsafe row. So this is just, just a contiguous um, right, like byte array. Uh, and the way that they do it, they store the value. This, this first chunk is each column. There's one bit for each column to say which ones are null. Uh, and then the second chunk is store the values if they're less than eight bytes. Yeah, if not, store a pointer to the larger uh, right, like value that lives in this sort of dynamic length section, that third section. So, and of course, now that you're starting to play with your own memory buffers and you now have to build your own virtual memory addressing, right? This is yeah, like an area that, um, for me personally, you know, yeah, I always think about the serialization stuff and then I would forget that this needed to be done the second step and I'd be like, oh man. But yeah, these Databricks guys cranked it out. Um, built their own uh, virtual memory addressing. And then there's this sort of alpha sort style uh, way to represent this data in a nice pa uh, packed manner, right? like a memory page. So you've got the key and value. Here, the key, this is a hash code, which is an integer, right? Int, which is only four bytes. So you don't have to take the prefix, like you can actually store the whole thing. And then you've got the key values all smashed together. Um, that's called bytes to bytes map. It's a binary version of that, like a append only map that I showed before. That doesn't have the uh, deletes and things like that. So yeah, just a quick summary. Pre-tungsten was this big blown out thing. Post-tungsten, uh, yeah, the exact same thing is um, nice tight uh, binary. More about the memory manager. The big thing here is if you are writing your own UDFs or taking UDF and then having to convert it over to Spark and then uh, Tungsten slash Catalyst. Uh, use this UTF-8 string. It's a slight change, like you're probably just using regular Java util string. But yeah, the UTF-8 string, that's the, the actual byte array version. This is that in-place update. So the, yeah, the high level here is uh, like aggregations. Yes, as you're uh, probably zipping through code, or through the data and continuing to, to calculate the average or the sum, um, yeah, you can actually like, do an in-place update. So that guy is using bytes to bytes map, but is using it in uh, like an optimized manner. So if you remember bytes to bytes map, was this thing, right, where it's got this uh, tightly packed key value. So now, if, if you're doing like an aggregation, you would just, right, like, yeah, like just keep updating that and not, not adding a new one and having to move things around in memory. So things like checking if two rows are, are equal, yeah, this has become a lot faster. It's just a bitwise compare, right, like versus checking, you know, calling is equals, or like a typical way where you're uh, creating a new uh, Java object and you have to write the equals method. 
get from Mary. Uh, the join code didn't actually change that much. They just switched from internal row, which is the old loaded Java way, to the unsafe row, the better. Right? Sorting, a few things changed. They're, they're doing uh, intelligent spilling, so, and, um, yeah, they actually know the exact count now because the data, you have the, right, like the exact byte array, so you know the size versus trying to guess based on Java, uh, you know, headers and, yeah, how bloated is Java making this particular object. See. Yeah, something else too that's cool is that you can actually merge compressed records. So if you're uh, trying to aggregate, trying to pull data down, you, you don't have to decompress it and then pack it in and then right, like recompress. So you can actually merge these right, like compressed uh, records. That's only if your codec supports it, right? Like which LZF does. So yes, LZF became the default compression I think as of Spark 1.3 or 1.4. So code gen, yeah, boxing is bad. Uh, you know, one thing too about the JVM is that if you if you stick to true object oriented, you know, where you have a base trait or like a base interface, and then you have subclasses and you know, nice and easy programmatically, um, that actually messes up JVM inlining. Right, like this whole. Uh, right, like the ability to um, sort of undo um, and right, like collapse code together. Uh, because if you have even one, so you could still design it that way, but if you can ensure that you're only using one subclass, then that's fine. But the second that the JVM sees a second subclass, then all the inlining stuff gets undone. So this is actually surprisingly um, a cause of uh, huge, huge pauses that are unrelated to garbage collection. So if there's ever a time where you've kind of wondered, hey, like I, my JVM is pausing, but I don't understand, like there's no garbage collection happening, it could very possibly be this, where the code has been running for, for so long that things have been inlined, and then all of a sudden now uh, you start using like a, a second subclass, so it has to undo all the inlining. So what you can do is actually trick the JVM into thinking each of these polymorphic things are actually separate classes, right? Like don't share that same polymorphic. So that's one benefit of CodeGen is that you can uh, probably trick the JVM. Um, you can, let's see, if you have the overall plan, if you know what that user is trying to do with this query, um, there's some optimizations you can make. I mentioned before you can push filters down and sort of rearrange things so that you're like minimizing passes through the data. Say that you've given this query where you're looking at uh, less than something and then greater than something, probably between two, two uh, right, like a range. Um, that is first seen by the logical plan as, as two separate filters, which would be two separate passes through the data. But by looking at the overall plan, you can then collapse those and say, well, actually, just go through once and do this compare on both sides. So, yeah, kind of a, a, a really basic uh, like example. But, yeah, and then also with CodeGen, you can, so now you have control over 8-byte alignment. So you can start to, to right, like ride those CPU cache lines effectively. Um, and then... There's this project called Genino that actually takes Scala source code, like the, the string, the Scala source code strings, um, and can generate bytecode. So that's actually what they use. I think at, at one point they were planning on using Scala quasi quotes, which is like a this like crazy macro thing that'll let you change the uh, code and all that. But yeah, they use Genino now for that. It's a little bit more, um, I guess, IDE friendly, a little bit more intuitive. So yeah, I mentioned that there were about a hundred um, of these that were rewritten. There's this base trait called expression.gencode. Yeah, so once you, that actually returns physical source code, that gets piped into Genina. Yes, yeah, so all these should be ones that you're familiar with, you know, like base64, um, yeah, MD5, uh, yeah, last day, yeah, isn't all, things like that. 
So if you do plan to write your own, take a look at uh, this particular pull request is really good. You kind of see the evolution. It's someone was writing the Levenstein edit distance, uh, kind of like UDF, um, where you pass in two strings and see how far they are from being different. Right? Like how many uh, other characters would have to change to match the other one. Um, you kind of see too that, that the guy makes mistakes and the, the Spark guys are try, right, like walking him through how to use UTF-8 string and that kind of thing. So, uh, But yeah, you start with this, that trait, you extend it, uh, take a look at, at right, like that example is really good. It's really not that much code, it's just, you just have to, you know, sit down and write it. Uh, you have to register the function with this function registry thing. Um, yeah, do some Scala stuff, and then, of course, don't forget about Python. Yeah, if you're going to do it for Scala, make sure you do it for Python. So a little bit about data frames. Uh, if you're using Python with RDDs, that's the worst combination in terms of performance. So hopefully no one's doing that. Um, data frames all go through Catalyst, so now Java, Python, Scala, R, SQL are all Right, like approximately the same performance. Whereas before, things would have to go from the Python process, would get serialized out to the JVM, processing would happen, and it would come back, all the results come back, and have to get, get really deserialized. So now there's some, some better ways to do that with uh, data frames. So. Performance results, yeah. And garbage collection. Uh, yeah, so yeah, definitely benefits from smoother garbage collection and faster queries. That's a summary there. One last thing on this is the last slide. I'll take a break. Um, yeah, auto scale. So this is one thing that like Netflix relied upon pretty heavily. You know, during peak peak viewing hours, um, we wanted you know more uh, like servers to be available. They would auto scale from a thousand up to four thousand and back down. Um, so Spark can now start doing this. There were some changes, actually, part of the Spark one 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 two, um, when they were rewriting Netty. They actually pulled out that that Netty network module into its own module that can now be reused by this external shuffle service. Um, and so this way, you can kill Spark, the, the Spark process, but continue to serve up and drain any data that you have that you're shuffling. So picture like the mapper um, is sending data down to the reducers, but right, like we actually want to kill that mapper like totally at some point. So first, we'll kill the Spark process, but that, that shuffle service that's living externally can finish sending that data and then it gets signaled and then that whole node could die. Um, yeah, one thing about auto-scaling is that, especially in Spark, scaling up, yeah, that's easy breezy. Scaling down is tricky because if you do have caching turned on, which you should, um, like throughout your cluster, you've now got RDDs, right, like data frame data that's cached in these different JVMs, and you're sort of, you've like purposely cache them there because you're going to be reusing them. Um, if you start to kill these things, now it's not going to fail, but it's sort of difficult to reason through because um, now uh, you're not only losing cache, but you're also losing, if there was active data that, like that was being operated on, now that data has to move to a different node and get rebuilt. So you'll notice some failures, but it, things will recover, it's just, yeah, like performance. So, yeah, be careful when scaling down. All right, so that's the, that was the first half. Okay, you guys okay? Still want more? If anyone has problems getting the uh, Docker stuff running, just let me know, I guess I